He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. I remember thinking two things when he punched me, one of which was, oh man, I'm going to be really late for work. But the other thing was, what did he mean about the United Nations? For most New Zealanders, political violence has always been something that happens in another country. They want normal screams then. They were right panicking. And then like when we looked down the road, there was a woman laid on the floor. Now, as we embark upon an election campaign, it's a clear and present danger in Aotearoa. I don't think I have a day here where I don't have threats and attacks. You give up reporting them. I, I, I live with security cameras on my house and nearly every angle you can come in. I think it is a very real threat. Miss and disinformation is rampant across online spaces, with the 2023 election campaign coming into view. It's even seeped into mainstream media like RNZ. It frequently fans racism, sexism, anti-Semitism. The list goes on. It ferments hatred and division. Experts, community leaders, and even people who've been active players in conspiracy theory networks are really worried about where it's taking us. There are the physical threats and violent acts, and then there is the corrosive impact on our democracy. Does anyone know what they're voting for anymore? If I had continued to believe what I was invited to believe, it was going to become a whole way of life of protests, of fear, of spreading misinformation. Who can you even trust if you can't rely on your own close family members? Whether it be in a family event or, or elsewhere, he's saying horrible things. It's uncomfortable. We want no part of that. We don't want any part of that at all, but you're father to these kids, right? So you're inevitably tied to us as a family. I'm Susie Ferguson, and this is Undercurrent, an RNZ documentary series on disinformation. This is episode six, Hallmarks. I've lost you again. Ah, I think I maybe have you back. Yeah. Yep, I'm here. Bear with me. The Zoom link to Indigenous Māori human rights advocate Tina Ngata in Tairawhiti. Can you hear me? It's pretty scratchy. Hello? Yes, the internet. Oh, hello. Oh, don't you again. Oh, don't hear me. 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 It, I don't know what is going on. We're talking about the amount of information that we're getting. You know, you newspapers and billboards and that kind of thing. Even, you know, 20 years ago, stuff has changed so much. Yeah, that's right. So it would have been like, you know, maybe 15 newspapers a day worth of information that we would have be exposed to. And that's currently the equivalent of reading 174 newspapers a day. Tina's quoting numbers from a 2011 study. The information overload that study was talking about has only accelerated since then. It's blown right open. And, and it's coming at us and it's in our hands and we can access it all the time. And, and so there's this is kind of open slather to information without any real supportive tools for analysing that information or dealing with the exponential increase in exposure to information. We haven't been provided with any of the kind of critical analysis skills to cope with that increase as well. TMI. There's too much information all the time. If you've been listening to this series from the beginning, you'll be feeling familiar by now with the sort of trends and problems that Tina's talking about here. Here's another one. In a recent survey of over 2,000 people for NetSafe, Māori were found to be significantly more vulnerable than other groups to seeing misleading information about racial tolerance Almost three quarters experienced it every month. And Tina's seen people in her rohe sucked in. And part of the problem is we're overwhelmed by the information explosion. In the last two episodes of Undercurrent, we're going to start grappling with what to do about all of this. Believe it or not, there are reasons to feel optimistic. We'll hear about those in the final episode. In this episode, you're about to hear from a range of experts explaining how to recognise misinformation and what you, as an individual, can do about it. (laughs) 
The sun was streaming in the window of Dr Jess Berenson Shaw's office the day I met her. She researches narratives, how we communicate big ideas and think about complex issues. And we're dealing with a lot of those right now. Think back over the last few years. 51 people slaughtered in the mosque massacre. We've seen countless natural disasters from earthquakes to deadly eruption and severe flooding. And that's before we even get to existential crises of the COVID pandemic and climate change or to major events in our own lives. It's fertile ground when we want answers or reassurance or someone to blame. Fear is a very potent way to get people to believe very oversimplified information and act in particularly simplified ways. When we're scared, we, you know, we run or we freeze or maybe we fight and that's about it. Uh, A lot of the time, those of us who want reliable information to be believed and used and acted upon responsibly are asking for much more complex behaviours from people, more complex thinking from people. So in some ways, um, those narratives which are driven by fear have the advantage in the sense that they, they're only asking for quite simple reactions to other people, to shut them out, to um, respond with hate and harm. We're asking for people to respond in more complex ways, to understand connection and to drive it But that's not to say that this isn't behaviour that a lot of us engage in every day in our relationships. It's like a muscle and it needs to be exercised. And that response, the fear, can be exploited by the algorithm. Jess Berenson Shaw breaks down how they stoke division and monetise outrage. Narratives that are very much about them and us, for example. Those people over there are doing harm to us and ours is a a really strong narrative that we see in lots of pieces of false information. And social media is constructed very much around um, exacerbating that particular response because the more outrage, the more clicks, the more money. So we talk about this again as a money-making mechanism for these organisations. And then not everything or everyone online, might be what they seem. When I meet Anjum Rahman, she's wearing beautiful gold bracelets she bought on holiday. You can hear them while we talk. She became a familiar voice after the mosque attacks and is now co-leader of the Inclusive Aotearoa Collective and on the Council of Internet New Zealand. We certainly know there are overseas actors, there are state actors that are manipulating you know, whether it's by bots, it's paid trolls or whatever, they're, they're manipulating the way conversations are had online. Director of the Disinformation Project, Kate Hanna, says the manipulation's deliberate and we know where some of it originates. We know from research internationally that Russia dis- Russian disinformation was um, clearly involved with the Canadian trucker convoy, which the New Zealand Occupation of Parliament was an offshoot from. Um, There's been really good research and evidence showing the involvement of Russian disinformation broadly around COVID-19 vaccination and mandates to encourage the Canadian trucker convoy. It's infringing a lot of people's movements, freedoms. People are isolating way too much now, especially in Quebec. The mandates, passport mandates, it's too too invasive. Uh, It just goes against everything that we have known as a a democratic people. I understand the pandemic. It, it, it has taken many lives, but you know what? There's no, there's no reason to lose my freedom as well. Russian disinformation tends to promote white supremacist um, and nationalistic narratives, uh, much like ones that were promoted by the Christchurch terrorist. It tends to promote transphobia and, and hatred and, and disgust towards um, communities across the board in that space and it tends to promote extreme misogyny. Um, Russian disinformation also tends to promote uh, discord and distrust, and again, we've seen um, disinformation working to alienate people from one another in New Zealand. So there are a lot of signals that there there is Russian disinformation influence campaigns taking place. Any idea of the quantity of them? Well, the thing is, is that it doesn't have to be someone in the Kremlin pushing a button and sending stuff to New Zealand. This material is being created by influencers, narrators, 
all over the world, it's following Russian disinformation lines because even if you're a creator or narrator based in New Zealand or the United States and you're not actually um, working for the Kremlin, you can see that that kind of disinformation is the most popular and therefore the most successful, is likely to get you the most followers, is likely to make you money and is likely to bring you fame and fortune. It's about money. Of course it is. But it's also about power, says Anjum Rahman. And it's done, you know, in order to get people to pay money. The likes of Jordan Peterson, Andrew Tate, Alex Jones in the US, those kinds of people, they earn a lot of money. Uh, And people are paying to view their channels, they're selling merchandise, they're selling, you know, hallfuls of seats for their speaking tours and without a concern of who's being harmed for that. So it, it makes money, but it also is a tool to get power because when you can get people emotional, afraid, angry, they're much more likely to engage. And so you see that it is a political tool that's been used for centuries. This is nothing new. I think what's new is is the spread, the reach, the virality that we have with the online space and also that national boundaries don't mean anything anymore. Okay, this is the bit where we're going to get really specific with ideas and strategies for responding to misinformation. If you're planning to take some mental notes, listen up. Good boy, good boy. You might remember researcher Donna Carson and her blue lovebird Harlow from an earlier episode of Undercurrent. She has some pointers about what to be aware of in social media groups aimed at women. It's kind of like pastel fascism, um, and it's just because you you know you could be into crafts and you you know could be into knitting and stuff. It doesn't mean that you're you know a far right supremacist or anything like that. But you can easily intermix with those communities and those people and not realise their ideology, and you can be a target for those people. So I mean, if you do get into a group and you know it's great, it's great, but then they start talking about women's roles, women's place in the world, um, about patriarchy. Uh, about politics, that type of stuff, I'd kind of take a second look. Um, and if the imagery is always only white children um, and, you know, not diverse, that's another kind of signal that mm, there's something wrong here. And they kind of use language like, you know, there's nothing wrong with white kids playing with white kids. But is it only ever white kids? And they use trad wives Um, kind of anti-feminism and it is on a spectrum and a continuum you know it's not an instant you're a far right you know but you're you're more susceptible and there's some research that has come out like that was saying it's actually up to moderate conservatives to start challenging the extreme conservatives or the extreme right because they can connect on similar issues whereas if the left side of the thing argues with them, then it ends up being a zero-sum game. Um, But conservatives should be actually saying, you're actually hijacking our values and we're all getting tainted with this brush. Donna's talking about quite a direct approach here, basically politically like-minded people calling each other out. In other circumstances, this style won't necessarily work. There's evidence that debunking or myth-busting, for instance, is not effective. Jess Berenson Shaw explains why. The more we're exposed to a piece of information, the stickier it becomes. So we tend to recall information like who told us that information or where we heard it from or things like the word not, like those are less sticky. So, and if you think about the extraordinary amount of information that we're exposed to every day, both if we are being exposed to Uh, incorrect and false and unreliable pieces of information, even for the purposes of debunking it. It all just goes into this big kind of bucket of pieces of information. And, you know, the more we hear a term or an idea, it doesn't really matter where it's come from, the more it sticks. So what do you call them? The screening room? Mm. Is that where we are now? Yep. Why is that? Quiet place to come and have a wee scream if you um, if you feel that you need to. Oh. 
which is very therapeutic. I'm in a soundproof booth at NetSafe with... Sean Lyons, and I'm the Chief Online Safety Officer at NetSafe. Comfy mini sofas, padding on the walls, but a hard plastic table. It's one of those days I've been carrying round an extra layer in case it got chilly, and that cardigan's coming in handy to cushion the sound. It's going over the table. My impromptu... My um, fortune teller. Oh, yeah, it does have, it does give it a bit of a fortune teller vibe. Sean Lyons has some top tips for spotting fake news. One. People love to be the first to find something. And when you do find a piece of news that you haven't read before, maybe there's a wee um, endorphin buzz that goes on. But stopping and thinking about why am I the first person to have come across this? Is there anybody else anywhere talking about this? Is there any other place other than where I'm reading this now? that has even suggested anything like that. And, and not to say that they can't, you couldn't be the person that found the first source of a, of a particular fact, but if, if you're reading it from somebody that's saying, we have discovered this, is there somebody else that's picking it up as well? Secondly... The other thing to think about is, is who is that source? Despite what it looks like, is this actually a news media outlet? And not to, to do down the value of citizen journalism, but there are lots of organisations out there that represent themselves as a media outlet that are not actually a media outlet. And you'd have to ask the question, if you're just somebody with a group of opinions, then why are you calling yourself a, a media outlet? So think about where that is and, and, and take a look at the other kinds of information that that outlet provides. If it's a, you know, a broad range of, of, of stories and information and things that you've seen before, then perhaps you know, that maybe this is a, a scoop for them. But if it all appears to be on a single theme, if it all appears to be you know, at the absolute polar ends of, of, of public opinion, then start to wonder about what the focus or the function of, of, of that outlet is. And third... And the, you know, the last thing, before you, you, you start thinking about reposting them widely... Find someone that you trust. Run it past them. It, it seems like a very simple step, but I think people's urge sometimes to say, wow, look at this thing I've found. Um, we forget to do what we might do in, in any other circumstance, which is find a family member, find someone you trust and say, I've just read this thing. What do you think about that? Because maybe if they're not feeling the same excited rush, they're more likely to provide that kind of level-headed view of that sounds like rubbish, or that's a really good point of view. This asking questions of the origin of the information and running a ruler across it is called lateral reading. You're not determining whether or not something's true or false. Providing alternate facts to people is not what we're doing here. We're teaching them lateral reading, those three questions, to be able to apply in any information setting, to be able to say... Is this something that I can give credence to? This is Dr Sarah Hendrika Bickerton from Toa Toa, which works in digital equity and runs a programme called A Bit Sus, which trains school librarians. What kind of terrible person you are if you don't like a school librarian. To support schools and students in countering misinformation and its spread. Sarah is careful about the notion of critical thinking as the antidote to misinformation. It can end up being misdirected, she explains. Generalised critical thinking doesn't work. Why not? Um, it's too broad. They might start applying that to sources that should be truthful and they'll end up going down a rabbit hole that may lead them into niches of the internet where um, it's not really critical thinking, it's what they think is critical thinking. And... That doesn't mean that critical thought and training is not important. But in order to deal with mis- and disinformation, you need to provide low-touch ways of people being able to do quick and easy decisions because people don't have the time to be a critical media analyst of all the media around them. They just don't. And we've acknowledged that over time. We have for TV, for radio, for print, we have standards authorities that are between the individuals, the consumers, and the producers. And because we realize that offloading that entirely to individuals, not in our society with how much is pressure we put on individuals anyway, making that ever more so, no, it's not, it's not a good approach. This isn't about recreating the wheel. We've got these things in place. 
we've got these standards and approaches that we've we've developed over time that work. I mean, are they perfect? No. On the most part, it's not that difficult to do. A lot of social media has little in the way of formal standards. So what is a low-touch way of quickly assessing things on there? But one thing I always do is I put a tougher lens on things that I agree with than things I don't. And that means that, like, do I need to share this? It's like this confirms to my pre-existing beliefs and makes me feel good. That probably should be something that I should be thinking a little bit more about. Now, again, I'm not necessarily assessing the validity because there's a lot of topics out there that I'm not an expert on. And I'd love it if I was an expert on everything, but I think that's a rather unreasonable expectation of me or anybody. So... Doing those approaches where you're not having to be an expert on a topic, but just taking a moment, taking a pause. There's another proactive approach Sarah suggests called pre-bunking. It's a play on debunking, but it's pre-bunking. It's saying, okay, so this piece of information is out there. This is the way in which the misinformation about it's being spread. Um, what might be ways, of, different ways, correct ways of thinking about it. There's uh, something known as a truth sandwich approach to dealing with it, where you provide a fact about a topic, you describe the kinds of misinformation about that topic, the logic behind the misinformation, and then you finish up with a, a fact. So there are certain cognitive biases that human beings have. One's what we call anchoring bias, where the first discussion of a topic that you come across tends to be the one that anchors you. OK, we're getting pretty technical now and the jargon's starting to fly. So let's tie hua, pause and recap. Here are some golden rules for what we've canvassed so far. First, two ways of spotting misinformation. Number one, if you've found something that seems so extraordinary that it should have been reported somewhere else, then you should stop and think about why. And number two... Look closely at sources. They might look and feel like a legitimate news site, but a closer examination of what's actually being published might suggest something else. And here's three strategies for addressing misinformation. One, trying to counter misinformation by debunking is rarely effective. Try a truth sandwich instead. Number two, get a trusted friend or family member to look at something extraordinary sounding before you rush to repost it. And three, apply greater scrutiny to things you agree with and pause before you share them. There's more about this on our website, rnz.co.nz slash undercurrent. NetSafe also has a page, yournewsbulletin.co.nz, with advice on spotting fake news. There's one more bit of advice to share on this. It's for people with kids in their lives. I think schools in New Zealand do a fantastic job of making young people aware of just how important that um, that critical uh, media literacy is as an aspect of them them growing up. And I think young people, on the whole, do a fantastic job and are more likely to challenge, more likely to say, oh, hang, hang on a second, when something comes new and out, out of the blue. But two things. This is Sean Lyons from NetSafe again. One, what would you do right now if you came across that story that no one had ever heard of? And, and you know, the, the explicit teaching of, of what it is that they need to do. But the other thing, and probably the more important thing, is the degree to which we model the right thing as adults for the young people around us. Um, how often do we talk to them about the issues that we face ourselves to let them know that the issue is, is OK? In fact, that somebody came at you with this stuff. We all face that. Sometimes we don't know how to deal with it. Admitting that, that's also really important, that we seek out help from other people, um, that we sometimes maybe ask young people what they would do in order to get that help. All of that stuff um, is the appropriate modelling. And the other aspect of the modelling thing is don't do that stuff. Don't spread it. Don't don't inflame people. Don't, don't get into the public, angry, aggressive harmful debate. Nothing wrong with respectful debate, but if we get into that mudslinging, name-calling, whatever that might be, be that on text or social or, or the words that we say down the phone, those things are not lost on the young people that see that. That's what they see as the social norms. So that's another golden rule. Talk openly with young people about misinformation and show them how you go about processing it. Can you hear me? 
Oh, you can't hear me? Oh, I can hear you now. This is so weird. <laughs> oh. The connection keeps coming and going as Tina Ngata and I kōrero. She says, in Aotearoa, we have some good forums and frameworks for addressing misinformation. If you have a look at some of the information um, responses in Scandinavia, in Finland, um, in the Netherlands, you know, a lot of the education around that is also in different ways looking at how you make sense of new information and how you respect new information and you carefully consider it before you interact with it and you make a decision about what you're going to do with it, either dismiss it or take it on as a part of your perception of the world. So we already have some of those frameworks and narratives that actually come from here. Our Kura Papa frameworks, which are designed for immersion, but I think that there's some principles in there that are really well suited to dealing with this kind of information um, as well. She says it's about getting out into the real world. We debate and make sense of information um, on our marae during a pōhiri, also in the kitchen when we're cooking the food for people. Um, those are hot debates. I mean, you want to find out what's going on in a community, you go hang out in the fight fight in the kitchen while they're cooking, or you can sit around the table at the staff room at the, um, at the local kura, or you can listen to the every radio station, or, um, you know, you might go to a wānanga or, you know, other spaces uh, where people and they'll debate with each other around what that new information means. And they don't just talk about what it means in terms of what they read. They're like, what does that mean in terms of who we are and where we live? What does that mean for our farmers? And so, you know, there's the online space and then there's all of these other spaces where we make sense of information. And if you can support all of those other spaces where you're having face-to-face discussions with people that you know, the people that you have relationships with, the people who are actually going to be there for you when the thing, when things go hard. Those are the types of places that if you galvanise, you can take the wind out of the sails from online interference and external interference. Next time on Undercurrent. They let each other know when the racism starts up and then they will go in together and start to have these conversations with people in the comment sections. It's fascinating to watch aggression turn to uncertainty and scepticism turn to apology, curiosity or a spirit of collective inquiry. The reasons to believe society will not be overwhelmed by misinformation. And I was interested in finding a way where I could counter the arguments that were coming from the family members in a way that wouldn't be rejected. And uh, that, that's what they talked about. So, so we did the training. That's next time on the final episode of Undercurrent. Undercurrent is an RNZ series created, produced and presented by me, Susie Ferguson. It was written by Susie Ferguson and John Hartfelt. It features the voices of Vivian Bell, Richard Chapman, Francesca Ems and Carmel McGlone, produced with Duncan Smith. The studio engineer is William Saunders. The executive editor is John Hartfelt. For more information and resources, visit our website, rnz.co.nz slash undercurrent. Mm-hmm.